Hello everybody, welcome to the Erie County Envirothon 2021 Soil Section. My name is Zachary Warning, I'm a soil scientist working out of Belmont in Allegheny County, New York, but I actually grew up in Erie County and I participated in the Erie County Envirothon for all four years of high school. That being said, I know what the mentality of my team was going into soils, that they were boring and difficult. That's why I never did soils, and why I didn't even take a class in soils until I was a junior in college. So let me be your assurance. Soils are the farthest thing from boring, and the challenge, though completely over-exaggerated, I assure you, only serves to make soils even more exciting. I'll be presenting this video in 10 segments, easily digestible that you can go back and revisit individually for help, and I will exclusively source test questions from these videos, but I'll include some extra fun books and videos and things at the end if you're curious. So to start, let's answer a very important and surprisingly misunderstood question. What exactly is soil? Part one, what is soil? If you Google soil definition, the first result reads, the upper layer of earth in which plants grow, a black or dark brown material typically consisting of a mixture of organic remains, clay and rock particles. It's a good start, but it just barely scratches the surface. For the purposes of the regional envirothon, they define soil as the collection of natural bodies on the Earth's surface, in places modified or even made by man of earthly materials, containing living matter and supporting or capable of supporting plants out of doors. In my opinion, that's just too much jargon, and it doesn't touch on the most important aspects of soil. Wikipedia says soil is a mixture of organic matter, minerals, gases, liquids, and organisms that together support life. All of these functions, in their turn, modify the soil and its properties. That definition has an important distinction from the previous. It notes the role that soil plays in supporting all life, not just plants. And it begins to highlight what separates soil from dirt. Soil is alive, the living flesh of the earth from which all terrestrial life comes and to which all terrestrial life will one day go. Soil is not just an ecosystem. It is the most biologically dense and abundant ecosystem on the planet, housing one out of every four species on Earth. In just one gram of healthy soil, you can find thousands of nematodes and protozoa representing hundreds of individual species, millions of fungi of about 5,000 different kinds, and billions of bacteria of about 10,000 individual species. In just one handful of soil, by sheer numbers alone, there are more living organisms than there are people on the planet. So for our purposes, here is a comprehensive definition of soil, building on those provided. Soil is the living sponge on the Earth's surface, comprised of a mixture of organic matter, minerals, gases, liquids, and organisms, which supports all living things. Soil has three main parts. Minerals, pore space filled with air or water, and organic matter. Minerals typically take up about 45% of the volume. Air and water each take up 25%, and that last 5% is organic matter. By minerals, I mean sand, silt, and clay, in order from largest to smallest in size. A sand grain is easy to conceptualize. It's visible to the naked eye, and it ranges from about two millimeters down to just half a millimeter. Clay is the smallest, invisible to the naked eye, being any mineral particle that's less than 0 0.002 millimeters. Silt is any particle in between. When you figure out how much sand, silt, and clay you have, you know what we call the soil's texture. We'll get into texture more in another section. So how does this seemingly magical substance capable of transforming death into life, cleansing the air and water from toxins, and supporting the immense diversity of life here on Earth come to be? The process of soil formation has a name, pedogenesis, from Greek pedon, meaning soil, and genesis, meaning origin. There are five main factors that influence soil formation, following the acronym CROPT. Climate, relief, organisms, parent material, and time. Climate refers to how much precipitation an area gets and what the average temperatures are like over long periods of time. 
Relief is the shape of the Earth's surface, such as mountains, hills, and plains, sometimes called topography. Organisms refers to the great abundance and diversity of life I referenced earlier, which work together to break any formerly living things down into food and nutrients for living things. Parent material describes the kinds of rocks or transported sediments that the soil formed in, whether it was deposited by a lake, called lacustrine, glacier, called glacial till or glacial outwash, river, called fluvial, gravity, colluvium, or wind, aeolian. And finally, time. The soils of Erie County are considered young to moderately old, only about 10 to 12,000 years old, and their properties reflect that. Other soils around the world are much older. To form just a single inch of usable topsoil, it takes about 500 years. So although constantly being made around the world, soil is functionally a non-renewable resource. The immense number of combinations of different climates, organisms, relief, parent materials, and time has produced a remarkably diverse set of soils on Earth, from the heaviest pottery clays to the coarsest beach sands. A large part of my job as a soil scientist is producing soil maps, charting where soils with different characteristics can be found. In fact, soils are so diverse, they have their own system of taxonomy, just like plants and animals, which we use to describe them. We won't get into soil taxonomy in this video series, but you should be aware that soils are extremely diverse and express a wide range of characteristics. Part 2. Why does soil matter? If you end up working with soils for your career, you'll have to answer this question a lot. Why does it matter? And regardless of whether soils end up the focus of your career as it is for me, everyone should be able to answer that question. Why? Farmer and poet Wendell Berry puts it best. The soil is the great connector of lives, the source and destination of all. It is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, death into life. Without proper care for it, we can have no community, because without proper care for it, we can have no life. No force on earth has toppled more civilizations than soil. Throughout history, their value was either misunderstood or taken entirely for granted. Untold billions of tons of healthy, rich land have washed away into the seas over the millennia, plowed to excess, robbed of their protective plant cover, or simply harvested until their last nutrients were consumed and never returned. Today, one-third of the farmable land on Earth can no longer produce food. Food insecurity grows, and in the face of climate change, many scientists have realized soil is our greatest and perhaps last hope for a sustainable future. As Rattan Lal said at the 54th Nobel Conference, linked at the end of this video series, the degradation of soil is as great a threat to global peace and security as, quote, ICBMs and nuclear proliferation. Even today in America, the problem is far worse than it appears, with intensive fertilization, tillage, and imported organic matter hiding the true extent of the degradation of our soils. That may sound depressing, but soils offer us a silver lining. Healthy soils cleanse the air and water, produce untold amounts of plant matter, cycle and store essential atmospheric gases, and outside of the oceans they serve as the second biggest greenhouse gas sink in the world. Many climate scientists have come to the realization that without soils, we cannot overcome our climate crisis. But with soils, we can not only mitigate but reverse the damage we've done to this planet. If you're interested in learning more about that, check out the videos I'll throw in at the end. Part 3 soil characteristics. Now that we've established what soil is and why it matters, let's talk about the essential characteristics of soil. As I mentioned in a previous section, your typical soil is about 45% minerals, half pore space filled with a mix of air and water, and 5% organic matter. Let's start with that mineral section. In the field, soil scientists like myself will estimate the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay, or the texture of a soil, by rubbing it between our thumb and fingers when it's moist. If it's gritty, it's likely got a lot of sand. Soft and flowery, likely very silty. Pliable and moldable, it's likely got a lot of clay. We estimate the percent of each, and then look to the soil textural triangle. This chart is easy to use and very helpful. For example, let's say I have a soil which I've determined has 20% clay, 40% silt, and 40% sand. By following the lines printed on the textural triangle, we find a label at the point where the three lines meet, telling us that our soil is a loam. 
Loam is what we call a soil with a similar influence of sand, silt, and clay, as just a little clay can have a very large influence on soil. Practice on your own coming up with random proportions of sand, silt, and clay, and see what texture you end up with. The names may seem confusing, and I remember my group members baffled at the idea that a loamy sand and a sandy loam were actually different. Simply put, a loamy sand has more sand, and a sandy loam has more loam. So now we're going to touch on the pore space. So when I first gave that definition of soil, I said it's like a living sponge. And that's a good analogy, because just like this sponge here, it appears solid, but a large percent of this is pore space or empty space. Just as in a healthy soil, about 50% is pore space. So just like this sponge here, soils have different sizes of pores. There's macro pores, which are large pores that water is going to flow through, and there's micro pores that water will enter, but the micropores will hold that water against gravity. So that's essential for plants when they need water in drier times. And when it rains and the water moves through the macropores and drains out of them due to gravity, then you get this balance of the 25% air, 25% water, where the macropores are gonna hold your air and the micropores are gonna hold your water. And that's essential for soil life. A healthy soil has a good mix of macropores and micropores. And when you've got a decent amount of macropores, uh, the soil it has good percolation, so water moves through it very easily. And when you till or compact a soil, you actually reduce what we call the permeability or the ease of water entering the system. So I'm going to demonstrate that with this sponge. I've got some water in this tub here. And when you take the sponge, which we're going to assume is our soil, and you soak it up, this is when it's raining. The rain is filling in all of the pores. and when I lift this sponge out of the water, that is going to simulate gravity pulling the water out of the macro pores. So once this sponge has drained out of all of its macro pores, this excess water, that would be in soil terms what we would call field capacity. Field capacity is when a soil is moist, but all of the water that cannot be held against gravity is drained out. But what's amazing about soil is that you can see it looks like it's pretty much finishing up draining out but look how much water is held against gravity by micropores far more water than macropores really and that is what is so important for plants keeping moisture during dry times one of the most visually striking differences between soils is color Many soils are black or brown, as the Google definition said, but soils can also be red, white, gray, orange, yellow, green, and even pink or purple. So here I have a resource that soil scientists use to categorize the color of a soil in the field. This is called the Munsell Soil Color Book. And we use three main variables to determine the color of a soil, hue, value, and chroma. The hue is indicated by these tabs, starting with 5R, which R stands for red, and moving into the YRs for yellow-red. Eventually down in here we get to Y for yellow. And then these last four tabs are gray or gray, and that's for soils that are particularly white or gray, very pale. So the hue is just how red, yellow, green, purple a soil is. The value is how light or dark the soil is. And the chroma indicates the intensity or the strength of the color. So around here in New York, we're actually going to use 7.5 YR very commonly, as well as 10 YR, which is the page immediately following, and even into a little bit of 2.5 Y, because our soils in New York here are yellow and red shades of brown, usually. And once we've decided on a hue value in chroma, let's say 2.5Y51, we'll notate it just like that. 2.5Y51 shows us that it's gray. Another visually striking characteristic of soil is its structure. Soil structure is the way individual particles of sand, silt, and clay are assembled. When many single particles assemble thanks to roots, fungi, and the natural glues such as the kinds earthworms produce, 
they form what we call an aggregate. So a healthy soil at the surface should have these visible aggregates. It's called granular structure, and they look sort of like breadcrumbs. Uh, a good comparison might be cottage cheese. And these are being held together as they break apart. They break apart into these chunks. And that's because they're held together by these biotic glues and even roots. And these are essential for soil health because macropores and micropores are found between and among soil aggregates. So if you don't have any structure, like if you plow a soil or till a soil, and destroy all these aggregates, you will lose your pore space and air and water will have a much harder time moving through the soil and your soil will be much more susceptible to erosion. There's all sorts of soil structures. There's from granular to columnar, things like that. But for our purposes, you should be familiar with just a few main types. Definitely granular. Granular structure is the surface structure in the A horizon of any healthy soil and even some pretty degraded soils in New York State. And you should also be familiar with blocky structure. If you go into the B horizon, you're going to find blocky structure very commonly in New York soils. And the last one that you should be familiar with is massive structure, which essentially means structureless. And that's what you're going to find naturally in the environment in the C horizon, the weathered parent material. But you can also find what looks essentially like massive structure in heavily compacted, heavily tilled surface soil. So that's a sign of an unhealthy soil because when you get the massive structure and you've lost all your pores, your macro pores especially, um, you end up producing a soil that is very difficult to, for water to enter into uh, and for air to move through. And you'll see the results in the plants that you grow in that soil. So finally, we're going to touch on pH. Soil scientists like myself will use pH kits like this in the field to get a quick assessment of pH right there on the location. So we'll use the, this little tray. You put soil into these large dishes just a little bit, and then we add chemicals that turn certain colors based on the pH, and we read these charts to assess what we think is the closest match. pH is very important for soil health, as if your pH is around neutral, plants have the best access to the macro and micronutrients that they need for growth. Many plants have adapted to acidic or basic conditions, but near neutral, especially for crops, is about what you're going to want. And in New York, our soils generally range from about a pH of 5 to a pH of 8. So using the, the characteristics that we described earlier, we describe what we call soil horizons. And many horizons, it is the case that they visually look very different in terms of color. But it's also the case many times that the color might be very similar, but the texture is different, or the pH is different, or the structure is different. And in that case, we're going to have to look at those other characteristics that we've described to differentiate the horizons. We differentiate horizons using capital letters. The major horizons you should know are O, A, E, B, C, and R, although no soil is guaranteed to have all of these horizons. The O layer is the litter layer, often very thin and not usually present in agricultural soils. The A horizon is where agricultural soils begin, and it represents the topsoil, where the soil organic matter is found. The E horizon, common in forest stands dominated by evergreens, is a thin, usually chalky white or gray layer in the soil, showing where nutrients have been leached out or eluviated, thanks to the soil being quite acidic. The B horizon represents the subsoil, and the C horizon is the weathered parent material. R designates where bedrock is found. And many soils do not have bedrock near the surface, and so do not have an R horizon. Soil horizons often have a small letter placed near them, such as capital A lowercase p, to indicate a specific attribute of that horizon. In the case of AP, the most common type of A horizon for agricultural soils, the P simply means the soil was plowed. Once we've described and designated the horizons of a soil, we have what we call a pedon description, with a pedon being the smallest observable unit of a soil. 
Head-on descriptions are the basis of our soil series descriptions, with a series being the soil's equivalent of a species. Part 4. Reading the Landscape Next time you're out walking in the woods, observe the shape of the ground. Is it flat or sloped? Is the slope like a bowl, concave, or like an upside-down bowl, convex? If it is flat, are you near a water source, such as a river or a creek? Is the ground wet? If it is on a slope, how steep? Is the ground dry? How do the plants change when you go from one type of landscape to another? Do you see any bedrock sticking out? These are the questions soil scientists ask all the time in the field. Knowing where you are on the landscape is a critical part of knowing the soils, and it can tell you a lot about them before you even dig a hole. In general, convex slopes tend to shed water, which makes them drier. Concave slopes tend to collect water, so they're usually wetter. Valleys tend to have creeks or streams running through them, and the shoulders, or slopes right near the hilltop, tend to have bedrock sticking out near the surface. Broad, flat hilltops tend to be wet. All soils have what we call a drainage class. This ranges from excessively well-drained to hydric. Drainage class refers to how high the seasonal water table is in the soil, and how well a soil holds on to water that enters it. We can tell where the seasonal high water table is by looking at the rust-colored and gray discolorations in the soil, called redoxymorphic features, created by the oxidation and reduction of iron and manganese. Hydric soils have unique properties and protections under the law, as many of them qualify as wetlands. In order to meet the definition of a hydric soil, it must be sufficiently wet in the upper part to develop anaerobic, or oxygen-free, conditions during the growing season. Hydric soils are unique because without oxygen to accelerate decomposition, they build up much more organic matter than drier soils. Hydric soils, and wetlands by extension, must be drained in order to be farmed. When drained, they're some of the most productive soils we have, referred to as black gold. However, undrained, they serve as carbon sinks, filter out pollutants from water and air, and serve as habitat for rare and unique species. Hydric soils are best used economically by keeping them as they are, as their environmental benefits in the form of wetlands far outweigh the potential profits from draining and farming them. Hence, current laws prohibit the draining of wetlands unless a new wetland is put elsewhere to replace the valuable and vulnerable habitat. Before even getting out into the field, soil scientists look at topographic maps to get a sense of what the topography or relief will be like. Each line indicates an elevation, so lines close together represent steep slopes, and spaced lines represent gradual slopes. When topographic lines converge to points and valleys, the point shows you the direction water is flowing. By using the north arrow to orient our maps, we know which slope faces which direction. South-facing slopes tend to be drier, and north-facing slopes tend to be wetter because of differing amounts of sunlight hitting them. All of this information allows us to focus our expectations for what the soil in a particular area will be like. Slope is one of the most important factors for determining what a soil will be like. In the field, we use a tool known as the clinometer to determine slope. So here we have the clinometer, and when you're going to use this in the field, you take this end here with the little uh, eye hole, and you're going to put that up to your eye, and you're actually going to keep both eyes open, and these numbers will appear in your vision, and you're going to read the numbers on the right side. But keeping the other eye open, you're going to focus on an object that's down slope from you, or up slope, uh, that you know to be at the same height as your eye level. And that will allow you to assess the slope. Reading the numbers on the right side of your vision will tell you what the slope is. Part 5. Soil Survey So a soil survey is a detailed report on the soils of an area. And it's got maps with soil map unit boundaries, pictures, descriptions, tables uh, of soil properties and features. And they're mainly used by farmers, especially real estate agents, engineers, land use planners, and anyone who desires information about the soil resource. And there's actually a helpful glossary at the back that has all sorts of soil terminology if the descriptions that you find in the soil survey book are a bit confusing. So here we have the soil survey for Erie County, and it's big, but don't be intimidated by the size. 
because this back half is actually all soil maps. So these soil maps show soil map units and the soil map units are basically polygons showing the local distribution of a soil of a particular kind. So just where that soil is occurring on the landscape. And we use special symbols to notate them. In the case of this book that I have, which is an older copy of the Erie County Soil Survey, uh, they use letters. But many, especially modern surveys, we use numbers. Um, either way, it's just a symbol to tell you what the soil series is. And as I said in an earlier section, the soil series is sort of the soil's equivalent of a species. So when you see the notation with the symbol, let's say, for example, the state soil of New York, which can be found in Erie County, it's called Honey Oil Loam. In Erie County, the survey that I have here right in front of me, it's symbolized HO. And then following the symbol, you'll find a letter A through F. And A through F just indicates the slope. Uh, because slope is one of the most important characteristics for what you're going to be able to do with that soil. So we find honey oil on slopes from 0 to 8%. So we have symbols for HOA, A slope being 0 to 3%, and HOB, B slope being 3 to 8%. Slopes go all the way up to F, as I said. So the delineations for the slope are A, 0 to 3, B, 3 to 8, C, 8 to 15, D, 15 to 25, E, 25 to 35, and F slope is anything in excess of 35% slopes. So we don't really want to farm any soil that is over a C slope. Once you get into that range, into that 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, it becomes very limited what you can do with the soil. So. If you want to see what soils are present where you live, uh, you can open up in this book to the initial map page, which is going to have, first of all, some good information about the geology and the age of the soils and their characteristics. But the more important page that you're going to want to look at in this is right here. This is Erie County, and there's a grid overlaid showing which map page is over which area. So if you can find generally where your school is or your home, you go to that map page. Then you'll find whatever soil symbol is over where the, the area that you're looking at. And then you can go into this earlier part of the legend and look up what that symbol means. If it's HO, for example, if it was HOA, that's honey oil loam. So if we go to the honey oil loam page, you can see here it says HOA, honey oil loam, zero to three percent slopes. Might be a little difficult to see, um, but it gives you a good description of the soil, the common characteristics, and it tells you their common uses. So the soil survey is an extremely valuable resource for learning about soils of a particular area. And it will tell you especially interpretations for the soil. So if you really want to know what you can do on your land, that's one of the first things that you should do. If you get a new home or you're on a new property, find the soil survey for that area and look into the properties of your soils and you'll be surprised what they can and cannot do. All soil surveys can be found online by searching for the NRCS Soil Survey application Web Soil Survey. On the home page, in the left-hand column, there's a tab for archived soil surveys. Select New York and then scroll down to find Erie County. There you will notice that the current survey does not exist in paper form at all. Rather, it's found in the database. To see the most recent survey for yourself, click the green button on the home page labeled Start WSS. Then, under Soil Survey Area, select New York and Erie County. Then, click Set AOI, meaning Area of Interest. Then, near the top of the page, select the Soil Map tab. And there you go. If you want to focus on a particular area, such as your home or school, in the Area of Interest tab, type in the address under the Quick Navigation tab. All the soils data collected and maps created by soil scientists are available to the public via WSS for free. Part 6. Soil Interpretations So how do we take all of these characteristics and properties and turn them into something practical and usable by landowners? That's where soil interpretations come in. 
soil interpretations evaluate or predict how suited or limited a particular soil is for a particular use, or what the potential response of a soil could be. Interpretations are applied for uses from agriculture to forestry to development. The USDA puts soil series into designated land use classifications, such as prime farmland, prime farmland if drained, or not prime farmland. The example series used in a previous segment, Honey Oil Loam, is designated as prime farmland. Interpretations are key for making soil survey data useful to businesses and producers, and they're the main reason that we map where different soils occur. They're built on cutting-edge science and research, and thoroughly reviewed and tested before being recommended to the public, as we want to make sure that people have the best possible information before making use and management decisions. Interpretations for the soils of Erie County can be found in the Erie County Soil Survey. Part 7. Threats to Soil The day Congress met to hear the speech of Hugh Hammond Bennett, the father of soil conservation, pleading with the legislature to create a permanent soil conservation service, the sky over Washington, D.C. was dark shrouded in the dusty remains of the rich topsoil of the plains. The urgency of his message was felt, and on April 27, 1935, what we today call the NRCS was created. Erosion is in the same vein as climate change, in that it is an issue which proceeds slowly on a day-to-day -day basis, making it difficult to notice in the short term, and yet when the collective results of decades of neglect appear, they are overwhelming in scale and detrimental in effect. There are two main types of erosion, wind and water. In New York, wind erosion only has a significant effect on our soils with very high amounts of organic matter, such as drained hydric soils. Water erosion takes three main forms, sheet, rill, and gully erosion. Sheet erosion occurs on hill slopes when a thin layer of topsoil is removed over a whole field or hillside and may not be readily noticed. Rill erosion is when runoff forms small channels as it concentrates down a slope. If the rills become deeper than 0.3 meters, it is referred to as gully erosion. The cost of soil erosion is nearly $45 billion annually, with $100 million of farm income lost every year. On average across the country, for every pound of produce we make, we lose six pounds of soil to erosion and annually in the United States, we lose soil 18 times faster than it is being made. Around the world, especially in places without agencies like the NRCS, the number is much higher, on the order of 20 to 30 pounds of soil lost per pound of food grown. In just 250 years, the time it takes to make half an inch of fertile soil, 50% of America's original topsoil has been washed away. That eroded soil must go somewhere, and so the flip side of erosion is sedimentation, a process which can fill in rivers and damage infrastructure around the world. Multiple measures are taken across the country to reduce erosion. Using cover crops in the off-season provides vegetative cover to protect the soil from the surprisingly powerful impact of raindrops, holding the soil together with living roots. Minimizing tillage practices allows soil structure to build without interruption, creating larger and more stable aggregates capable of absorbing heavy rainfalls without washing away. Avoiding plantings on steep slopes and keeping crop rows perpendicular to the direction of slope also helps to prevent the formation of rills and gullies. Hedgerows and windbreaks in the form of permanent standing vegetation as well as proper irrigation can mitigate wind erosion on those drained hydric soils. In forestry practices, harvesting only in dry or snow-packed conditions prevents the formation of ruts from heavy machinery, which can last from decades to centuries. Part 8. Soil Health A comprehensive understanding of soil begins with thinking of the soil as an ecosystem. When we harvest food, fuel, and fiber from it, we are really harvesting the energy and byproducts of billions of soil microorganisms which call the soil their home. In thinking of the soil this way, it becomes clear that our focus should not solely be on the crop, but also the resource from which the crop is born. The interaction must be reciprocal, with us replenishing the energy and nutrients we take, or else the system becomes unsustainable. When we harvest crops and leave the fields barren for months, we are essentially removing the habitat of the soil microorganisms, reducing their abundance, diversity, and health as a result. 
In addition, without the protection of the vegetation, the soil loses its stability, undergoing wild fluctuations in temperature and moisture, freezing, scorching, drying, and drowning what few organisms remain. Our agricultural fields, once richly diverse with bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and invertebrates, are left dominated by the rapidly reproducing bacteria specialized for our small number of crop species. Without the complex relationship of thousands if not millions of organisms over long periods of time, the soil loses its functionality and our harvests dwindle, both in quality and quantity. And so the most fundamental principle of soil health is keeping the ground covered, ideally with living plants. Even better, a diverse cover of plants. Barren land and monocultures are nearly non-existent in nature. Plowing should never be practiced, and tillage should be minimized as much as possible, if not eliminated entirely. Proper nutrient, manure, and pest management is key to ensuring the plants are healthy and that the nutrients are not lost to streams in runoff, although a diverse cover of plants takes care of most of this on its own. Wherever possible, integrate crops with animals, as in the natural soil system, plants and animals work together to keep the system healthy. The goal, in essence, is to mimic the natural system from which the soil was born and which healthy soil serves to maintain. An unhealthy soil is easy to diagnose, if you know what you're looking for. From the moment you start digging your pit, the soil is tough and compacted. The roots are often sparse and stunted, running laterally along planes of compressed soil material. The plants appear wilted or unusually small, and being more subjected to disease, they show the common signs of distress, drought, and nutrient deficiencies. The soil itself is often structureless, with little to no pores for air and water to move through, and creatures like earthworms and other invertebrates nowhere to be found. The surface layers, once richly dark with organic matter from the continued recycling of dead plants and litter, are left pale and dry, regardless of how much rain has fallen. Neglected for too long, and a soil environment which once housed a cornucopia of species from all kingdoms of life will be left looking, for lack of a better word, like dirt. Barren, dry, and utterly lifeless. There are a lot of visually striking demonstrations we can use to show the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy soil. So here you see a soil from a pasture that has not been tilled in 20 years. And you can see how much visibly darker it is than this soil of the same texture, which is far lower in organic matter, much more pale. And this is called a slake test. So these two graduated cylinders have these mesh nets in them, and we're gonna see what happens when I just set these aggregates inside standing water. So we'll start with a healthy soil, like a sponge. You can see it's not doing anything, not breaking apart. It's allowing the water to enter into the pores. But let's see what happens with the unhealthy soil. It is destroyed as without any of that biotic activity, none of those biotic glues to hold those pores and those aggregates together, the water rushing into the pores destroys the soil. This is why erosion is so bad on heavily tilled soils. They can't hold together against the force of even standing water, let alone the force of raindrops. The difference speaks for itself. The second demonstration will be presented by NRCS employee Ray Archuleta in a short video segment. I want to show you how soil disturbance through tillage impacts soil function. Here are two soils. This soil has been disturbed by conventional tillage. This soil has not been tilled for 40 years. It's virtually undisturbed. Watch what happens when I simulate rainfall on these two soils. The undisturbed soil allows every precious inch to infiltrate. This is good for your production and for the environment. 
The disturbed soil does not allow the water to infiltrate. Most of the water is going to run off. Place your soil into drought mode and put your nutrients into the nearest lake. When it comes to building healthy, productive soils, remember, do not disturb. Part 9. Summary and Objectives So after watching these videos, what should you know? What should you be able to do? You should be able to provide a good, comprehensive definition of soil. Also, be able to describe why soils are important and what benefits they provide people and the environment. You should also be able to define parent material and give an example, such as lacustrine, fluvial, or aeolian. In addition, be able to list the five soil forming factors, cropped, climate, relief, organisms, parent material, and time. Be aware of and able to describe what soil is generally comprised of, what soil texture is, and how to determine the texture of a soil on the textural triangle, what structure is, how to use a clinometer to find slope, and the difference between concave and convex, and what that slope shape tells you about the movement of water, how to use the Munsell soil color book, what the importance of soil pH is, what the major horizons of a soil profile are, and how we determine the drainage class of a soil. Next, know what a soil series is and how to use it. Understand how to interpret a map symbol and how to know what slope class it's in. Be aware of soil surveys and what their use is, as well as who uses them. Know how to define a soil interpretation and give an example of a USDA land use classification, such as prime farmland. Be able to define erosion and sedimentation Identify and describe the different types of erosion, wind, water, sheet, rill, and gully. The economic impacts of erosion, and an example of a practice used to mitigate erosion, both in an agricultural setting as well as a non-agricultural setting. Know the definition of a hydric soil, what its characteristics are, how they're used, and what their economic value is. Finally, give examples of how to identify a healthy versus unhealthy soil, and give examples for how to maintain or improve the health of a particular soil. If you have a handle on the major concepts and ideas presented here, you will be on your way to success in the soil section of Envirothon.